Hey guys, it's Paper Mario Fan 42 and I'm here to explain why you should not buy Paper Mario the Origami King. You see, this game is not a direct copy of the Thousand Year Door, so dear god, please do not buy it. Paper Mario The Origami King released just a few weeks ago to mixed reviews. A lot of older fans of the series want to stay away from the newer games because of how much it has changed, while Sticker Star and Color Splash almost entirely lacked characters and story, The Origami King is completely different. This game actually brought both of them back, although they are both still simplified from the originals. In this video, I'll pick apart each aspect of the game and explain why I think The Origami King is a worthy sequel to the first three games. The first major criticism against this game is the combat. The game has changed things up again, and this time it's actually quite unique. Gone is the sluggish and painful combat of Color Splash, and replacing it we have... well, it could be worse. I didn't like the combat much at first, but I grew to like it more. The battles consist of you turning the arena around to line up the enemies so that you can take them all out in a straight line with your jump attack, or take out a wide range of enemies with your hammer. It's usually not very difficult to figure out how to arrange the enemies, so a feature that didn't seem very necessary was cheering. The game's combat is already easy enough, and now you can hold the Y button to automatically arrange and damage the enemies at the cost of a few coins. Your ring movements must be carefully timed as you are always racing against the timer to get the enemies in their proper place. Which is what I would say, if you couldn't buy as much time as you want using coins, which just makes it even easier. Coins are already easy to get in large quantities from doing literally anything in the overworld as well as fighting enemies, so why can they be used to turn the game's already straightforward battles into effortless press two buttons to win fests? After getting a certain item in the game, we can go to the settings menu and... You know what? Who even needs these? You can even increase the maximum amount of time you can buy which completely devalues the timer. And to top it all off, the game once again has no XP. At least with Color Splash you could get things to increase your maximum paint for completing battles. But here all you get is coins. All in all, the game's combat system is quite fun to use. It's simple and unique, and once I got past the obvious flaws, I had a lot of fun with the intuitive mechanics, which takes us to the next part, the boss battles. The boss battle system is awesome. Rather than placing Mario in the center and having him line up the enemies, Mario is placed outside of the arena and he must turn the tiles to make a path to the boss. Each and every boss has unique weaknesses and abilities that Mario must take advantage of and carefully avoid, respectively. The gameplay of the boss fights is fun. Some of the bosses are quite challenging too. I found myself dying multiple times to the scissors one-shot attack. And I struggled a bit on the hole puncher fight because he can literally decrease your maximum health by punching out your face. This is a Mario game. Four of the game's bosses are elemental bosses, Pokemon-like creatures that get their names from elementals. We have Earth, Fire, the water and ice. Once you unlock the Velementals, they can be used against other bosses or for changing things in the environment. The Velementals are always needed to progress the game's story, which brings us to our next topic. This game genuinely surprised me with its story. It actually gets kinda dark. You gotta believe me, it even says so on the back of the box. Whoa. The plot is pretty basic. Generic villain takes over the world by turning things into origami. To be honest, it's not that far of a departure from the previous game story. After all, the first two games were pretty much just Bowser attacks again, but this time he's invincible. Aliens attack. Stop them. It's nice to see intelligent systems bringing back the darker plots instead of just having a repeat of Bowser kidnaps the princess. Oh no. I'm looking at you, Sticker Star. I can't believe I made it this far into a Paper Mario video without making fun of Sticker Star. You see this game? Sticker Star? Yeah, yeah, that game was bad. <laughs> so now that you've listened to me compare the story to the previous installments, let's find out what that story actually is. Probably should've done that first. 
We start in the Mushroom Kingdom like always, but this time everything is being folded into origami by the evil King Ollie. Ollie takes Peach's castle and kicks Mario out of it. Somebody took cues from New Super Mario Bros. U. The goal of the game? You team up with the King's sister Olivia to destroy all five of the streamers. I won't go into too much detail about the game story, but I did want to talk about one specific character. This is a bob -omb, and his name is... It, it's just bob -omb. I'm gonna refer to him as Bobby because that's what Olivia calls him and it's a much better name. Bobby is kind of an original character, I mean he's basically just a generic bob -omb, but with a missing fuse. Step in the right direction for sure, but it still doesn't come close to the variety of original characters from the first two games, and super- Anyways, Bobby is a super important character to the game's story, as I'll mention in a bit. He has a unique personality, much like the partner characters from previous installments. He suffers from amnesia for most of the game, but eventually regains his memory after a fireworks show in Shogun Studios. Spoiler warning for the next part, even though you've likely already heard it. After the second chapter of the game, you reach a place called Sweet Paper Valley, the place that connects the Autumn Mountain region to Scorching Sandpaper Desert. Here, Mario and Co. encounter the Origami King himself, Ollie, and he throws a giant boulder down onto Olivia, trapping her. After she somehow manages to survive being crushed, Bobby thinks of a solution, however he doesn't tell Mario exactly what that solution is. Mario and Bobby must travel to the Princess Peach to get a suitcase, and once they get that suitcase, Bobby explains his backstory. Bobby, a modern Paper Mario character, actually has a backstory which is something you never see out of the series anymore. Once the pair return to Sweet Paper Valley, Bobby shows Mario what was in the suitcase. When I first saw this while playing the game, I really thought it was fake. I thought they were just gonna say, psych, two seconds later and bring Bobby back like they did with Wiggler and Mario and Luigi Paper Jam, but no. He just sacrificed himself to blow up the rock and save Olivia, and that's why Bobby is the best character in the whole game. Nintendo really tried to add some darker plot elements to this game, and it worked. At least, it worked a lot better than it did in Color Splash. Bobby's sacrifice added so much extra depth to this plot that otherwise was relatively simple. Long live Bobby, the best Paper Mario character. Also, Bobby for Smash. This game's visuals are incredible. It's like if you took Color Splash, an already beautiful game, and made it even better. My one complaint is that they forgot to add the hyper-realistic lemons. I know, try to contain your anger, I will never forgive them for that either. Every location in this game is incredibly well designed and unique, however I'm only gonna go through a handful of the game's locations, because there's a lot of them. Gone are the generic Mario locations in Sticker Star, instead we have places such as Toad Town, which in my opinion is the best version of Toad Town out of any Mario RPG, even Paper Mario 64. It's colorful and massive and there's lots to do. The next location worth mentioning is Autumn Mountain. I really like the idea of a mountain themed after Autumn, hence the name, and this place is just that. The orange, red, and yellow color scheme is warm and vibrant, and the water that the water elemental spits out looks amazing. If only Mario Wii U from Miiverse were here to see this. Shangri Spa is an incredible spa in the sky, complete with an entire jungle on it. The main spa area seems to have taken cues from the over there from Super Paper Mario, Except without all the stuff about death, yeah that game got pretty dark. 
The difference here is that the over there stairs were god awful. They were just garbage waiting to be burned in a chemical fire and kept far away from humans. Scorching sandpaper desert is an endless wasteland of purple sand. Not much else to say. Mario traverses it using the boot car, and when he first enters said boot car, he starts playing Doom for some reason. As part of the story, Mario must find 40 faceless toads inside an ancient pyramid and gather them all up to dance. Nintendo truly never will top this game. Hands down, my favorite location in this game is Sniff City. The neon lights, the music, the vibe, that one Sniffit surfing on the fountain, the other Sniffit that says this, everything about this place is incredible. It would be perfect if destroying the streamer didn't bring back the sun and make it daytime again. Shroom City just isn't the same as Sniff City, the fact that it's daytime now completely ruins the aesthetic. Sniff City is and always will be infinitely better than Shroom City. The final location I wanted to talk about is Hotfoot Crater, not only because it's your obligatory lava level, but because of what happens here. Bowser's airship crashes into the volcano just below Peach's castle, and Mario, Kamek, Bowser, and Bowser Jr. must all escape and reach the castle. From here, the stakes just escalate to incredible levels. Mario Jr. and Kamek are being chased by a massive horde of paper macho Goombas when Kamek performs a selfless act and duplicates himself to block them off, allowing Mario and Jr. to proceed safely. Then Jr. tries to take out an entire horde of them by himself. Not the smartest idea, but it's Bowser Jr. we're talking about. Now only Mario, Olivia, and Bowser are left. Once they get close to the top, Mario and Olivia are nearly overrun by the Paper Macho Goombas. That is, until Bowser spits a fireball at a stalactite on the ceiling, causing it to fall right in between the Paper Macho Goombas and Mario. The scene ends with Mario, Bowser, and Olivia loading into a cannon and firing themselves all the way to Peach's castle, kicking off the endgame. This entire section of the game is perfect in nearly every way. It takes the concept of watching your allies fall along the way from the final chapter of Super Paper Mario and improves upon it. In that game, most of the characters stayed behind to fight their rival and take revenge, with the exception of Bowser, who stayed behind to hold up the ceiling. Whereas in this game, the characters give themselves up to let Mario proceed. Everything takes place in a very short amount of time, rather than across the four-act chapter structure of Super, making everything much more tense and raising the stakes to exponential levels. This is one of my favorite parts of the entire game. Paper Mario, the Origami King does not deserve all the hate it gets. Sure, I can see the complaints about the battle system and the lack of XP, but people need to give this game a chance, rather than just avoiding it because it's not like the Thousand Year Door. I had a lot of fun with the game, and it did certain things even better than the Thousand Year Door, like having a lot less backtracking. I'm looking at you, Chapter 7. The game has a great story, awesome visuals, great moments, and some well-written original characters. I'll admit that I was a little skeptical about the game when it first got announced, mostly due to how the previous two games went, but upon playing it, I had just as much fun as I did while playing the first three games, sometimes even more. I highly suggest picking this game up if you haven't already played it. You won't regret it.